All right, let's go move on to part three. We're still looking at chapter three, Persia and Greece. And now we're going to focus on Greek culture, starting off with philosophy. Uh, philosophy, simply defined, is the study of wisdom, or the study of knowledge, the love of knowledge. So basically people who try to understand how the world works, why it works this way. Um, and that's pretty much it. And the Greek philosophers, they have three main ones that are super influential to our civilization, which includes Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. Uh, so we're talking about our civilization, I'm talking about the Western world, right? So Western world basically is Europe, uh, the Americas, Australia, New Zealand, right? That's called the West. And then the Eastern world is pretty much all of Asia. So uh, we always see this conflict where we talk about the West versus the East, um, and it's still you know relevant to this day. But uh, the idea of the West begins with the Greeks, and therefore their philosophers, uh, their uh, their philosophers, their ideas uh, have kind of spread across the millennia, uh, uh, across thousands of years of history, and reached us in the Western world to this day. Now, the first guy we look at is Socrates, right? His famous quote is, the unexamined life is not worth living. So his thing was that you want to ask questions. You want to understand everything. If you uh, are blissfully ignorant, then that's a horrible way to live your life. Uh, and he would ask questions of his students. You know, why do they think this way? How did they come to such conclusions and stuff like that? And once you get asked those questions, you start kind of evaluating what you believe in and why you believe in it. Uh, and the idea is that by through self-evaluation, through self-questioning, you can eventually lead to the truth, whatever the truth may be. Uh, this idea of questioning people and questioning authority eventually got himself into trouble. Uh, once he questioned the Athenian government during a time of war, so he got arrested and he was charged with the crime of corrupting the youth because he was telling young people to question, you know, the stupid ideas of their parents and their the adults. And as a result, he was uh, forced to commit suicide as a form of uh, capital punishment. Now, uh, Socrates' student was called Plato. Uh, Plato, uh, he is... Um, He's known for many things. For one thing, he wrote a book called The Republic. Uh, and in The Republic, he said that the best government is a government ruled by the intellectuals, by the philosopher kings. Uh, so that, you know, you have at the top of society all these philosophers who are educated and smart and obviously rich to become educated. And that, uh, and he himself being one of them, viewed himself as, you know, a potential leader. Uh, that's the book of the Republic. He also created a university type of school called the Academy, where he uh, would hold these kind of philosophical uh, classes. And he also believed in the realm of the forms. And it basically, he believed that in this world, uh, we live in a physical world where there's no perfection. But that beyond this world, in a more like a spiritual world, uh, is the realm of the forms of perfection. And he gives us a famous, there's the academy, he gives us a famous um, story to teach us this way. And the story, um, the allegory of the cave. All right, so he says, imagine that there's these guys living in a cave and they never left the cave and they lived under the cave their whole lives, right? And that they're changed to the wall inside a cave. And all they could see is the reflection of the shadows on the wall uh, as things are being you know, put in front of a light source, in front of the fire. So all they see is these shadows, right? And these guys grew up living their entire lives believing that, that these shadows, that that's it, that this is a horse and this is a bird and this is a circle, right? Because that's all they know, that's all they've ever seen, that's all they understand. And then he, the story goes on and says, that imagine if one of these guys is able to escape from this cave and go outside into the real world, right? Into the normal world, not the cave world. And he sees a real horse and he sees a real bird and he sees a real vase, a real circle, whatever. And he realizes, hey, 
those things, those shadow reflections in the cave, they're not the real thing. They're just kind of like a cheap copy of the real thing because the real horse is much more impressive than this shadow horse, right? Uh, and then when he comes back and tries to teach these guys about the real world and the real things that exist out there, they kill him because they refuse to accept that there's anything else out there than what they've already know to understand, right? What they've always believed in. And the kind of the message of the story is like, if if the things, you know, if the shadow things are a cheap copy of the real things, then are the real things a cheap copy of something else? Like, how do we know that what we see in this world isn't the true thing? Maybe there's something else better, a better version of it, and that's what he calls the realm of the forms, where everything is perfect. All right. Uh, Aristotle's other famous say. All right, so then moving on. Uh, in the school of the academy, we have another philosopher called Aristotle. Aristotle is Plato's student. So it's a teacher, student, teacher, student, teacher, student. Uh, and he comes up with uh, the famous rule called the golden mean, which is all about moderation. That's much, not too little. Right? Uh, so if you are cowardly that's not a good thing if you're foolhardy you know you're going to battle without backup that's just stupid uh the golden mean is to be courageous uh so he believes that by having a living a life of moderation is the best way of living he believes that to understand the world we need the empiricism that is taking down observable data right making observations and writing stuff down and making more observations and writing more stuff down and comparing your observations and the notes to see if things change. So it's basically kind of like the earliest form of kind of like the scientific method, if we want to call it that. And he also comes up with these ideas of logic, like what, how do you prove an argument type of thing? Uh, so an argument, you know, if you say one thing, you know, you need to be able to back it up with facts, right? Not other opinions and stuff like that uh, to make a logical uh, argument. So Aristotle is the other philosopher. His big thing is, you know, uh, logic and empiricism and the golden mean. And he's also the tutor of Alexander the Great, which we'll talk about soon. Uh, so uh, here's a famous painting of uh, this is uh, Plato and this is his student Socrates. I'm oh, sorry, uh, this is Plato and this is Aristotle. Uh, so here we kind of see the, the big difference in the two kind of fields of philosophy that we now uh, know as science and religion, right? So here we see Plato pointing up, pointing at the sky, saying out there, somewhere up there is a perfect world that we cannot see and we cannot, we can only try to understand. And that's something you just have to take on by faith, right, through religion. Uh, while this guy, Aristotle, is saying, you know, just look at his hand motion, he's pointing down. He's saying, no, everything we need to know is right here in front of us here on Earth in this physical realm that we live in, that we can observe and we can examine. And everything we need, to, you know, to understand the world is right here in front of us. Uh, so we see kind of, here's the, the religious spiritual guy basing everything on faith, and here's the guy who's basing everything on logic and reason and science. All right, uh, Greek religion is up next. Uh, Greek religion was polytheistic, believed in many gods, uh, and the religions and the stories and the myths, more than anything else, they were used to teach morals. So the question is, you know, did these people really believe in all these gods, and did they really believe you know, in all the legends and the myths? And more than anything, the answer is no. Uh, because even though they pray to the different gods, they didn't really think that the stories were actually true, that stories were this, the myths and the legends of the Greeks, uh, gods and heroes, uh, were meant to teach a lesson, they were meant to teach morals. Now, uh, like I said, they, they still did believe in the gods and they prayed to the gods and they would have priests and priestesses uh, to the gods. And one of the most important positions was the oracle at Delphi. And the oracle was kind of like a fortune teller, uh, and the you know kings and soldiers and emperors would come to the oracle at Delphi uh, to try to get advice as to what to do next, you know, in their in their government. And um, the oracle uh, was a woman a priestess, and she would sit inside a cave, and underneath her seat, underneath her altar, uh, were these volcanic fumes that would go up and uh she would inhale these fumes 
and she would go into kind of like these um like not illusions but like these hallucinations uh and basically she was getting high off of the fumes and when people would ask her questions she would just talk about these like random things right and then you have all the other priestesses there and they would try to like unscramble you know the random stuff that the that the that the oracle is saying uh, to give advice to the king or to the prince or to the ruler, to the emperor, to whoever it is that came looking for advice. Uh, so uh, this is kind of, we see, again, a uh, organization in religion. Uh, we also see synchronization take place. Synchronization is when you have different uh, cultures or ideas, in this case, religions, blend together to create something new. Uh, so, for example, uh, when the Greeks gained contact with the Persians and with the Egyptians, a new god is formed. This god is called Serapis, and you see him here. And Serapis is a mixture of the Greek god of Zeus and the Egyptian god of Osiris. Right? And those two combined equals this guy, Serapis. So we're as civilizations and, and cultures blend and interact with each other, we're going to see this often, uh, this event occur, the synchronization or the syncretism of blending of cultures and religious beliefs. Now, uh, the religion, um, you know, you had your temples, you do your prayers and your offerings, uh, but oftentimes you will go to watch a play, right, whether it's a comedy or a tragedy, um, and these were performed in religious festivals. So, you know, throughout the year, you would dedicate a week to, you know, one god. So then you would go to the to the theater, like you see here, the amphitheater, and, and you see these actors and actresses, you know, perform these uh, stories and legends and myths uh, in, as a way of honoring the gods, whichever god it is that you're honoring. And through the story and, the, and, and through the, the drama, the play, uh, as it's performed, you kind of you're supposed to like have this religious uh, connection with the gods. Uh, another form of religion, uh, or another kind of aspect of religion, is the epic poems of Homer. Uh, we mentioned the Iliad and the Odyssey, the two famous ones, right? And basically, we see uh, the, this epic poem is again is another example of how the gods can interfere and get involved in people's lives both on the good side and the bad side uh and how being on the right side of or doing the good things in life and doing the proper moral things in life uh will win you the god's favor uh other cultural achievements we have is this guy his name is Herodotus. he's considered the father of history uh but basically one thing he was a storyteller he would go around and collect stories from different people and ask them about their history and about their lives and their war and their conflicts and stuff like that. Um, so a lot of his writing is based off of other people's accounts, which raises the question of their authenticity. Like, is he exaggerating? Uh, is he changing the story around to make it fit, uh, you know, uh, make it fit what he wanted to be? Uh, so whether or not he was a true historian is up to debate. Uh, but his impact was that he was the first guy we know of, at least amongst the Greeks, to uh, actually write down history. Uh, another famous Greek is Pythagoras. Some of you probably heard him from geometry, Pythagoras theorem, you see here. Uh, the Greeks did make, make great contributions to, to math and to science as well. All right, uh, architecture, another big thing of the Greeks. Uh, Greek architecture, uh, the probably the most famous one, of course, is the uh, Parthenon, right, up here on top of the city of Athens. A lot of Greek temples, a lot of friezes. The friezes are these uh, carvings you see up there on the top of the uh, temples. Uh, and uh, basically, they, um, you know, uh, they were, you know, sculpt in, you know, story, uh, gods and heroes and stuff like that. Uh, it was always religion uh, being portrayed through architecture. Now, finally, we also have the Greek sculptures, which is their most unique, and most important form of art. Uh, and what we see is that compared to earlier forms, like say Egyptians or Mesopotamians, 
uh, the Greeks were very much lifelike. They're very much realistic, right? So you see, this is the discus thrower, right? The statue is over 2,000 years old. Uh, you see the rib cage, you see the muscles, you see the hand, right? So absolutely realistic, lifelike type of sculpting. And you will notice, of course, that almost all the statues are going to be naked. And that kind of goes into the Greek philosophy about the human life, right? Uh, they viewed humans as as beautiful, right? All humans, or they had a concept of human beauty, right? And it was young, and it was muscular, or it was, um, and it was, you know, it was young and fit, right? and they said that that's the ideal beauty, right? So that means all their statues, they wouldn't draw a statue or make statues of like a fat guy or an old guy, uh, because that wasn't the perfect thing. So they would always reflect on what they believed to be this perfection of the human body. Uh, and the absolute, um, kind of like the absolute um, embodiment of perfection are the gods, right? These The gods that they prayed to, they were human-like, they looked like humans, but they were just perfect, perfectly beautiful, perfectly forever young. Um, so yeah, they had the statues, they were, they were naked, and it, the thing was that they had no shame, they had no... Um, they weren't conservative about nakedness. It wasn't a big thing to them. Uh, and the idea was that being naked was the least of, you know, the least focal point of the statue or of the work of art. They wouldn't much rather care about, uh, you know, looking at the muscle or the face and stuff like that. So here we see another sculpture. Uh, this is of one of the gods. You see him struggling here uh, against some type of snake. And again, you see the ultra realism uh, of these statues. Uh, another part of religion is the Olympic Games. Uh, and the Olympic Games were held every four years in the city of Olympia. And uh, athletes from around the world would come in, around from the city states, I should say. Uh, they would come in and they would compete in different events like boxing and wrestling and running. Uh, many times they would do this in the nude. And again, it wasn't like a sexual thing. It was simply a natural thing. Right? Like you're at your most natural, vulnerable thing, being naked. Uh, and that really is kind of just proving that you're the best. Uh, and these competitions were held in honor of Zeus and the other Olympic gods. Uh, and the winner of the different events will be given a honor of wearing a crown uh, made of olive leaves and the respect of their people, of their competitors. And they will go back home, they'll be welcomed back as heroes. And the Olympic Games were held for about a thousand years in history, uh, all the way into the Roman times. Uh, and what we see is that the city-states will send their best you know, athletes to compete in these things. Uh, and during the Olympic Games, there was kind of like a truce that was called so that these athletes were able to travel freely without getting you know, killed in battle. Uh, and what this did, this kind of like tradition thing every four years, it created a cultural unity amongst the Greeks, right? Uh, what we call Greekness. So even though politically the Greeks were very much divided, culturally, as seen in the Olympic games, the ancient games, uh, they were very much united. All right, so that's it for part three. I'll see you next time.